editor's deck is super awkward. All right, so we're gonna go kind of out of chronological order. So the frame blew the motor up in September of last year. So immediately after that, we had a dune strip coming up in October. So I had an engine that I had purchased from the junkyard that was locked up, but it had a run stand that I wanted. So I sold the run stand, put the engine in the old barn, sat there to just rock because it was locked up and I didn't care. So Zach and I got that motor out after the frame blew up. And when we tore it down, we realized that the thing was just screwed. It was rusted, it had a really odd cylinder head on it, it had a one and a half inch exhaust. It was, it almost looked like a small block Chevy valve. It had hardened seats already installed in it, so I couldn't use the heads. Zach would put a picture of the heads up. He'll also put a picture of the other random stuff up of getting out of the barn, cleaning up, we put it in a vat of simple green and let it soak. Um, it worked pretty well. I still had to hammer the pistons out of the block of wood. And I eventually bailed on that motor, put another motor and used that. But now, fast forward a year, and I had ordered the parts to put that engine together in March of 2021. And they finally started to trickle in. I did the best to clean it up um, I could. The whole intention of this engine was to put this turbo on it, which was already in the frame. And ultimately, we're going to turn the boost up and see what stock rods and pistons will take. I'm going to be really conservative with timing. I put the mechanical advance back in the distributor. I bought an MSD boost timing control. So I'm going to ramp uh, timing in very slowly to avoid peak torque because the last motor built a lot of torque really fast. It was like 570 pound feet of torque by like 4,400 RPM to the ground with 17% converter slip. So the whole goal of this is to take a crappy engine I don't like. I bought a bunch of parts that were the only thing were available. Um, the cylinders are rusty, cylinder seven in particular, Zach will put a picture up of that, has really heavy pitting in it still. I'll put affiliate links to the hone I use. I use a uh, Lyle stone hone, and I go through the plateau brush, what people call a dingle ball hone, and finish it just to make sure it's got a really good cylinder finish for um, plasma rings. So this is a long time coming. I had a really hard time putting it together just because the parts I was able to get, ever know stuff's hard to get. The cam I got is not ideal. It is not at all what I wanted, but it's together. We'll put a clip of it idling, and we're gonna go through and do a whole series of little things you should know if you're gonna assemble a big block for, what to look for, um, and just best practice on things. And then we're gonna put it on the dyno after the June trip this October, and turn the boost up until it scatters. If it runs out of steam too fast, and camshafts come available again, I might actually change the cam because I think this one's gonna run out of steam around 5,000 RPM, which I would really like to see it run out to six. So we'll see what we can do. If I have to change the cam, I'll change the cam. And I, my goal is to beat um, my buddy Max 740 wheel horsepower in a stock bottom on LS. So I, he's gonna give me shit for it. We probably won't actually beat that one to try. Put a link to his YouTube. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> Alright, so I'm installing the last cam bearing and figured I'd show you guys this. When you go to install them, look at the oil hole, and this isn't going to work. But sometimes, almost all the time, you will see nothing because the camera will focus. Come on, oh, there it goes. Maybe, maybe. You'll see a little rolled edge right there in the oil hole. That's actually a little piece of metal, so I take a razor knife. And I can usually cut that out. Let's see if I do it right over my freshly cleaned engine. Zoom out. Take a razor knife and cut that right out. It's a little piece of metal there. Probably not ideal to run through your engine. This thing's got bigger problems though. I'm gonna deburr the oil hole, I'll install the last cam bearing. Um, the cam bearing bores without shells actually measured one and a half to two thou oversize, but I don't really care on this engine because it's not gonna live long. So I'm gonna red lock tight these in, 
let them sit hope it doesn't spin a cam bearing and we're gonna run it so i wouldn't normally do that but i already have this block out block cleaned up and taken apart and it's a piece of crap anyway so i'll knock this cam bearing in i usually roll all the oil hole oil holes the same direction that matters except in the front all the cam bearings in the big block four are the same one part number all positions i use dirt bond cam bearings i like them they work they're relatively inexpensive so that's tightened up we are going to take some red loctite which i have retaining loctite on the tool cart behind me or next to me but I already have this out and we're going to use way too much of it. Line up the oil hole and you'll hear how easy this hammers in because this bore is way too big. There's only about two and a half thousandths interference fit. See how we're doing on our oil hole. We're almost there. Probably use a better phone for better light than my iPhone 6, but it was in my pocket. And that's centered nicely in there. That went in far too easy. So loosen that up. Get her up. This piece before I pull it all the way through. I'm gonna clean all the Loctite out of here too. It's a Lyle cam bearing installer that I've had for about 10 years and I use the same adapter for big block Fords and LS's so that thing is wasted. But I'll clean Loctite up and that is the last cam bearing. So I'm gonna measure the cam bearing bores the dial bore gauge. Um, big block Fords, well actually every set of cam rings I've installed in the past couple of years have been real tight. Um, this one I think is going to be just fine right up until a cam bearing spins and I lose oil pressure. So I won't necessarily see losing oil pressure, but clean up the red Loctite and we're going to measure it and see how it looks. All right, I just set my dial bore gauge to the maximum bearing size, which is 2.1268. And all of these are about two to three thou over that. So we have lots of cam clearance. So we'll see how that works out. We're probably gonna end up running this on 1540 or 2050, which I don't typically like running thick oil, which I'll go into a whole long explanation as to pressure versus velocity and oil systems and what works best. But given how loose this motor is gonna be and the lack of longevity that we're gonna see in this thing, I'm going to run a thicker oil than I would typically run. So we're going to move on to the mains and see what those are. All right, I'm getting ready to check main bearing oil clearance. Uh, I typically use king bearings. I like them. They work well. Uh, they run a little bit looser than cleave. If you're going to run a cleavite bearing, you need to make sure you measure it and have the crank turned appropriately. In this application, like I said about the cam, we're going to run a little bit thicker oil than I would typically run. Um, I want this to be loose and have a lot of... Um, oil clearance and a little bit heavier oil to have a little bit more film strength for high boost because this will be a turbo big block. Um, when you pull bearings out, bearings out of the package, clean them. 
They may be brand new and they may look real nice, but if you take some acetone or some denatured alcohol and wipe them off, they aren't clean. You can actually see a little bit of bearing material in there maybe. But clean your bearings, make sure you put the shells on the right side. This is the block side shell. There's a, obviously a slot for oil to go through. Um, I already measured main bearing crush. Um, this block is actually pretty straight, shockingly. Um, but wipe them down, put them in. I'll go through, I'll install all the shells, I'll torque all the caps back on, I'll measure the dial board gauge. I do want this motor to be loose. Like I said, I did already have the crank polished to try and get a little bit more clearance. Um, I would really like at least three thousandths on the mains and at least two and a half or even three on the rods. Um, just because this motor is going to be pushed pretty hard. So I'm going to get this done and I will be back in a second. Well, it's a good thing I had the crank polished because I have the bearing shells torqued in there. I have the dial board gauge set to three inches and I don't have the camera focused in a place I can use it. So I'll go in there until you can see the actual dial board gauge. So my theory on thick oil versus thin oil is there's a bypass spring in the pump and the pump I'm going to use, I think is about 80 pounds. So you can go above that, but you'll run into issues. Let's see if I can see that dial board gauge. All right, I don't know if you can see this or if it's focused well enough, but we've got about 3.0015 for that bore, which gives me about 2,000 oil clearance since that crank is actually turned or polished a half thou under size. So a factory size is three inch. Um, that's the journal diameter of the crankshaft and then clearance is in the bearings. So. My thought on thick oil versus thin oil is if you run a real thick oil and your spring or your pump spring bypass is say 80 pounds, like going to the refrigerator, getting a mouthful of maple syrup, trying to blow it through a straw, you'll have a bunch of pressure but no flow to these back bearings. So I was hoping to run 1540 to have a little bit more film strength in the rods for a lot of boost. Um, that's not going to happen. I can't run 1540 and have the uh, velocity I need. Um, so I guess I'm just going to have to go with like a 530 or 1030 and We'll see what kind of pressure I have. I'm going to run the thickest oil I can without burying the gauge immediately. Um, but it's probably going to end up being like a 530 or a 1030, something in that range. And I also really don't like aluminum bearings. Anyone who's ever tried to weld or TIG weld and walk the cup, aluminum's real sticky. And that is also the case in bearings. The crankshaft, it, they're sticky. If you have uh, journal to bearing contact, it will smear that bearing real bad, real fast. The other thing is the stiffness isn't there, so typically I'd try and run like a tri-metal bearing, but this is what was available relatively quickly. I was going to put a bunch of time and money into this motor because I am going to blow this motor up intentionally to see what the factory uh, rotating assembly will take. I also was not able to get standard diameter um, King rod bearings, so I have Federal Mogul bearings, which I haven't used in probably 10 years, so we'll see how those measure. I did have ARP rod bolts pressed into the rods and the rods recon to get them um, up the middle or top of bearing crush spec to try and open the clearance up a little bit more and hopefully don't run too tight because like I said previously I would like closer to three thousandths on the rods um, I've run rods down to one and a half and they were fine I just would really prefer to be able to run a thicker oil in this application because it is going to see a lot of cylinder pressure but I'm going to get this uh, I'm going to hammer the core plugs in I'll show you one of the oil plugs that really matters and then I'll get it back in the stand and start measuring rods So when you get your oil plug kit, and I guess your freeze plugs and oil plugs, you'll get two different plugs. Well, you'll get more than that, but these ones are the ones that plug the oil galley. So you'll get a tapered plug and you'll get a flat plug. The flat plug goes in the back and you actually only need one tapered plug and it goes in right there. And if you look very carefully, let me see if I get some light in there, um, maybe. I'm gonna actually put a light at the back side of the engine, see if you can see in there. Oh no, there you can. It's kind of going out. You can see that hole has a hole that comes in from the other side. And that is, oh, let's see if I can get it a little better. I thought I had it. All right, we're gonna try this. 
All right, it's kind of focused. And we lost it. All right, you can see I've got a light in there. That is your main oil hole. If you plug that, you're gonna have lots of problems. That goes your number one main. So a tapered plug goes in there and doesn't block off that passage. The next hole over actually doesn't have that, um, but they give you enough plugs to put the tapered plugs both in the front. So flat ones in the back, tapered in the front. Don't put it in the wrong spot or you'd be real bummed. Then when you go to put your cam plug in, do not overdrive it. Drive it just past the taper and stop. If you drive it all the way in to the point where it stops, you're gonna put the camshaft in, it will not go in all the way. So you can kinda maybe see that I didn't clean off all the Loctite, so we can get a better angle on this. Nope, not a chance. I'm about to give up on that. But you'll actually be able to see some space in there. Oh yeah. You can see the space in between that cam bearing and the plug right there. If you hammer that plug all the way in, your cam will not go in all the way. So just a few things to be aware of. I'm going to put the oil galley plugs in. I red loctited the um, oil filter thread in. All the freeze plugs are in. And then we're gonna put it back in the stand and start final assembly. The bearings will not come out again. Those are staying in. They're cleaned, they're measured, and we're gonna move on.